Hello, everybody. Good afternoon from my side. My name is Beatrice Coda. I work in CINEA uh, as head of unit uh, responsible for connecting Europe facility energy and renewable energy financing mechanism. And uh, alongside my colleagues uh, from uh, European Commission, Directorate General for Energy and from CINEA, I would like to open now this info day on the call for the list of cross-border projects in the field of renewable energy. Uh, this call has opened uh, officially on, on um, uh, uh, 10th of January and will close on 5th of May in order to be eligible for SEF funding to finance uh, technical studies and works cross-border renewable energy projects have to apply and be selected uh, for this cross-border renewable list. And today, you will hear all about the requirements, the selection process, and how to participate to this call. The next slide will show you the agenda that we have today for uh, this afternoon. So we are delighted to have, uh, um, as an introductory uh, um, presentation, a speech from uh, Lukasz Kolinski, Head of Unit uh, for Renewable Energy Policy in DGNR. He will provide you the context of uh, renewables and cross-border renewable within the Green Deal objectives. Then I will introduce a bit more in detail uh, the cross-border renewable energy program and framework in the Connecting Europe facility. This will be followed by a presentation by Vasil Stoinov, also working as a policy officer in DGNR, in the Renewable Energy Unit, related to the eligibility criteria and the specific requirements on the cost-benefit analysis. And then this will be followed by a presentation from uh, uh, Gianluca Ferreri, project management coordinator in CINEA, regarding evaluation and selection process for this call. At this point in time, we'll have a coffee break to pick up your questions. I will come to this in a moment. And uh, we go then to a second part of the program uh, with Q&A with participants. And then a, a session, a very practical session, where uh, Paul Grandot, also working at CINEA, will provide you um, with, let's say, guidance on how to draft and submit your application in our submission platform. And this will be followed by the, the timeline and the, the call timeline and process will be given by my colleague Teresa Koenig from CINE as well. And we have a second set of final Q&A with participants. At this moment, I'd like uh, to give you also some uh, housekeeping rules. So uh, you have seen an hashtag, SEF uh, Energy CBRS. So we have a system uh, to collect uh, uh, questions via Slido, via this hashtag. So please do uh, along, uh, let's say, the presentation. Uh, we will stop uh, at the end of the first part. To, we will collect, let's say, the questions, and we will start to reply. And then after the coffee break, we'll continue, let's say, the Q&A uh, according, let's say, to, to the questions we have received. And then, as I said, there will be a final moment to take uh, to, to reply to the last questions. In case uh, uh, you are missing, let's say, part of the presentations or there are some questions uh, which might be too detailed and uh, we, uh, we will reply also in, in writing and the replies will be posted in CINEA website along with the presentations of today and the recordings of, uh, of today, so also a video. So you will not miss any, any important uh, uh, information. Uh, with this, I'd like to conclude this uh, first, let's say, introduction and housekeeping rules. And um, I'd like to give the floor to, to Lukas for his uh, uh, presentation on the policy context. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Lukas Kolinski, head of unit for Renewables and Energy System Integration in the Directorate General for Energy uh, in the European Commission. Um, I'd like to present to you a few slides on the policy context, but basically I would like to, to try to tell you why, in our opinion, it is a very good time to invest in renewables uh, across the European Union. 
Obviously, many of you have already heard about the European Green Deal, uh, the ambitious uh, agenda for climate and energy policies that uh, the European Union is pursuing. The long-term objective of this policy agenda is the achievement of climate neutrality by 2050 and uh, also um, the, establishment, the, um, the establishment of targets which would put us on a trajectory to this climate neutrality already by 2030. And in this context, you may have heard that um, we uh, have an objective of the greenhouse gas emissions reductions of 55% by 2030. That's compared to 1990 levels. This is very ambitious if you compare it with, uh, with other regions. And what is, what is important from the point of view of renewable energy is that these greenhouse gas emission reductions, they are achieved in the energy system uh, to a large extent through renewables. And the large amount of the emissions uh, in the European Union today, they come from the energy system. So renewables play a very strong, very important role in this uh, Green Deal agenda. There is also a more immediate uh, reason. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Um, the reason being that uh, we are going through the energy crisis, uh, which, um, which has been uh, provoked by, by Russia uh, and weaponization of energy by Russia and its uh, aggression on Ukraine. And uh, in response to this crisis, in response to cuts in gas supply, the European Union last year has come up with a, with a response, a response called Repower EU, and it's based on three pillars, energy savings, cutting the energy demand, and we have done rather well so far on this front. Across the EU, you, we have uh, already cut the demand for gas by 19%. It's based on massive acceleration of investments in renewables because renewables can substitute uh, the gas consumption, the consumption of gas that is no longer flowing to us. And then finally, obviously, the diversification of our energy supplies in order to, to replace the, the Russian gas. And we have cut down the dependence on the Russian gas quite deeply. But focusing on, on renewables, we are looking at the level of the share of renewables in 2030, somewhere in between 40 and 45 percent. The Commission proposed 45 percent. The European Parliament agrees with this. The Council currently looks at 40 percent. And we are finalizing negotiations on this. So we will have this target somewhere somewhere around these figures. And what does it mean, 45%? Well, this means basically twice the share that we have seen uh, last year. So we have seen around 22% of renewables last year, also in 2021, and we are increasing it uh, twice. It also means tripling the pace of deployment of renewables that we have seen so far. So it is a huge acceleration that we need in order to, to achieve these, uh, this target. And finally, you know, many of you are, are project developers, you might think in terms of capacities. So we have around 410 uh, gigawatts of wind and solar capacities installed across the EU, and we need just about 1,200 by 2030. So you see that on the demand side, on the needs side, there is a very, very strong policy push. Now, obviously, we need, to, we need the investments to, to deliver on these targets. I already mentioned that renewables are at the core of our policy making, and what we are doing is we are reinforcing the regulatory framework, in particular the Renewable Energy Directive, in order to deliver on these targets. We are uh, simplifying and shortening the permitting procedures, because obviously the ambition that we have put forward would be hampered if 
we continue with, uh, uh, with many, many years that uh, it takes to prepare uh, renewable projects in some countries at least. We are looking at 10 years, up to 10 years for offshore projects, uh, seven years for onshore wind projects, and, and sometimes four or five years uh, for solar. These lead times need to be cut, and, uh, and again, the directive that is being finalized will do just that. We will simplify and shorten the permitting procedures. And there is one piece of legislation that is mentioned here under the second bullet that is, in fact, already in force. The emergency regulation that was adopted in December that um, takes a few categories of renewables and shortens immediately the permitting times for, uh, for these uh, installations. So, as you see, we have done quite a lot in order to accelerate the rollout of renewables, and obviously these renewables will need to be deployed across all, all member states. But what is important is that in order to achieve these targets cost-effectively, we need to really use uh, all the areas with high potential for renewables, even if these areas are border areas and uh, areas between the countries or offshore areas. And this is where we have seen so far relatively less uh, interest of the investors. We understand that these cross-border projects are more complex, sometimes more difficult to, to finance. And that's why the European Union is coming up with, uh, with public finance, not only for uh, to support the deployment of renewables uh, within the member states, but also in order to support specifically these cross-border projects. And the, the instrument that we have for these projects is called Connecting Europe Facility Cross-Border Renewables. And this is what the bulk of the uh, info days today uh, will be about and I will stop here. Um, I will pass the floor back to, to Beatrice. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Lukas, thank you very much for this uh, uh, introduction on the renewable energy pro uh, policy. And um, I would like, in fact, uh, to, to start uh, my, my presentation from what, what you mentioned around uh, the massive uh, acceleration of investments in renewable uh, energy generation that we see in Europe and that where we need, uh, where efforts uh, from public and private uh, sources need to continue. Um, Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I hope you can see you can see my, my slides. Now, uh, and, and coming back, back to the instruments that uh, the European Commission has put in place also to support the growth uh, uh, of uh, investments in this sector, I would like to mention here a few of, this, of these instruments uh, together with uh, um, the, 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 the Recovery and Resilience Facility, for example, and uh, within the, the Repower EU uh, context, or the Cohesion Policy, uh, which uh, both provide uh, strong support to renewable uh, energy, energy infrastructure in member states. There are other instruments which tackle specific, uh, specific needs and have a specific uh, rationale in the context of investing in renewable energies. One, for example, is the renewable energy financing mechanism, which is also supported by member states. The other one is Horizon Europe program, in particular the so-called Cluster 5, uh, that supports innovation and research in renewable energy technologies. The Life Clean Energy Transition, uh, where that supports uh, energy efficiency and clean uh, energy projects for a smaller size. And last but not least, what uh, Lukas mentioned is the Connecting Europe Facility Energy, 
which is the financing instruments for interconnection of energy networks and uh, cross-border renewable energy projects. Now, these uh, last instruments that I mentioned are financed and are uh, by, C by CINEA that, let's say, is in charge of, of the implementation, and we also look at synergies across these instruments. But moving to uh, now what is exactly uh, and how does it work, uh, this Connecting Europe Facility program, um, the Connecting Europe Facility is indeed an instrument, uh, a new funding instrument, that focuses on uh, cross-border or transnational, let's say, cooperation and, and investments. It is, uh, let's say, effective in three sectors. It aims to develop and modernize trans-European networks in the fields of transport, energy, and digital. It pushes the decarbonization commitments. And there is emphasis, as I mentioned, also on synergies among sectors. A total budget of 33.7 billion euros across the three sectors. And um, the, um, for, for energy, we have a total budget of 5.84 billion euros, of which uh, divided into sectors, uh, the projects of common interest in trans-European networks, and specifically here, uh, the cross-border projects in the field of renewable energies, for which um, up to 15% of the total budget, so 875 million, subject to market uptake, uh, is, is dedicated specifically to the cross-border uh, renewable program. Um, the legal basis of this program is the CEF regulation together with the Renewable Energy Directive. And then there is a delegated regulation uh, which was adopted last year, specifically outlining the provisions uh, for uh, the rules of cross-border projects, uh, the selection and eligibility criteria, together with a staff working document that goes into uh, details. Um, what are the main objectives of this window for cross-border projects? Basically, the idea or the underlying objective behind this uh, focus window is to promote member states' cooperation uh, and as well as member states and third countries' cooperation based on mechanisms which are, um, uh, let's say, whose provisions are in the Renewable Energy Directive, and my colleague uh, Vasil will go into very much detail to explain this. Uh, these projects should help member states in achieving EU targets for renewables by providing more cost-effective options on where these projects should be built and operate in parallel to national measures of renewables or other support schemes. Furthermore, the idea is that they should also facilitate uh, rest integration and contribute also to uptake of innovative renewables and overall contribute to long-term decarbonization strategy of the EU. So in the next slide, we see a bit the process uh, to become a cross-border renewable uh, energy project. So first of all, in terms of process, and this is why we are here today with you, is to apply for the status of cross-border renewable energy projects. So we'll go through what, what are the eligibility, what are the requirements to become a cross-border renewable project. There will be a selection process uh, associated to this application, and once the selection process is completed, um, um, uh, the list, a list of projects, eligible projects, is uh, drawn and, and uh, officially adopted and, uh, and made public by the European Commission. These projects that have the official status of cross-border renewable projects, and they are in this official list, they are eligible uh, for future calls for uh, works and studies under the Connecting Europe facility. So it's a two-stage ap approach. In, in CEF Energy. So first, you have to apply and you have to become eligible uh, uh, under, let's say, the CBRS list. And once this first selection process, you have, let's say, privileged funding to uh, calls under CEF Energy for works and studies. And only the projects which are in this list will be eligible. So it's very, very dedicated funding uh, for them. What type of projects are eligible? 
uh, the projects which are eligible are renewables generation based on any renewable energy sources under the red, under the red. So the directive, uh, it covers all sectors, electricity, transport, uh, heating and cooling. And uh, uh, not only renewable generation assets are, uh, can compose a project, but also other ancillary and additional elements, for example, storage or grid connection. We'll go through the specific rules about that, provided that these additional uh, elements form an integral part of the project they effectively enable the integration and are ancillary to a renewable generation facility. Um, there are no uh, predefined capacity thresholds, locations, or technology. So that's also something to be kept in mind. So to conclude uh, on the status. So the status, why it's important? Why it's important to apply? Because it makes you eligible for this specific window for CEF. But we can also say that uh, the status offers increased visibility for your project. Uh, also, if you want to go to other, let's say, financiers or banks or others, it can facilitate possibly, uh, let's say, fin financing in, um, for, for your project, apart from giving visibility in public space at, and also, at, let's say, in, in, your, in your member states. Um, now we had, uh, this is not the first call, we had the first call last year, uh, it was the first to kick off this program overall. In the next slide you see uh, the three projects acquired uh, the status and um, they, they refer to uh, different technologies and different type of concepts also. So one girl, it's a Zogerle, Zorzelec, uh, it's, a car, it's a district heating. Um, a project across two, uh, let's say, member states, Germany and Poland. Then we have Elwind, an hybrid offshore project in, Baltic, in the Baltic Sea. And then Cicerone is a cross-border European green hydrogen value chain. I invite you to, uh, I mean, we have no time to go into the details of this project, but if you are interested on the type of projects that uh, were uh, given the status last year, you can find the information here in the link, and then you are invited to go to the CINEA website. We have developed a transparency platform which provides public information on, um, on the cross-border status projects, and uh, we also look forward to have uh, and to populate this transparency platform more uh, following, let's say, successful application and evaluation and selection of projects under this call. Last but not least, I want to say that um, it, together with uh, the, the status uh, process and uh, the uh, call for works and studies, so the, the self-call for, for grants, we also have um, an additional, let's say, possibility under CEF cross-border RES uh, for what we call uh, preparatory studies for which uh, you can apply uh, even without having um, a CBRES status. So it's a bottom-up call. It has a specific objective to provide financial support to kickstart cooperation projects and cooperation between member states in renewable energy. This, the, so it's really sort of pre-feasibility stage of a project. And topics that can be covered or financed are, uh, might be technology surveys, um, overcome the costs uh, and barriers associated to implementation of cooperation mechanism. It can be other legal or financial uh, first studies or environmental surveys. So we expect to cover uh, the next call for this type of instrument to open later on this year, possibly in September, to be confirmed. This concludes my presentation. Thanks for your attention. And I pass now the floor to Vasil for a detailed presentation on cooperation mechanism and requirements on the cost benefit for cross-border uh, RES projects. Good afternoon, colleagues, from my side as well. My name is Vasil Stoinov. I work in the unit of renewables and I'm the responsible officer in charge of uh, this 
window of the connecting here facility and I would like to expand a bit on some of the requirements of cross-border renewable energy projects. So the first question that we want to address is what projects are eligible for financing. This is defined by Article 3 of the Delegated Regulation and we're looking at projects which deal with renewable energy technology and which are based on cooperation mechanism, broadly speaking. Now the question is what, how, how do these projects look like? Those are individual projects. In the um, most common case, which might have physical or which might not have physical link. So an example of a project with a physical cross-border impact is a renewable energy installation, solar PV, onshore wind, offshore wind, doesn't matter, which is located at the border or in a border region between two countries and the electricity produced by this installation is flowing to both countries. Example of individual project without cross-border impact cross-border impact is a offshore wind park, which is located on the territory of one member state. And this cross-border project is supported financially by another country without any physical link, which could be on the other side of the EU. And this country can participate through financial <laughs> resources or sharing of experience <laughs> or another type of uh, support. In exchange of this, the other country might receive statistical transfers instead of actual electricity. Theoretically, there is also the option of multiple projects. One evident example is if two countries decide to set up together a joint support scheme, resulting in a statistical location of the projects between the countries. In this case, the cooperation will be based on multiple projects covered by this joint support scheme. On the next slide, I would like to mention which are the eligible technologies. So every project that produces renewable energy is eligible under the project. Renewable energy is defined in Article 2 of the Renewable Energy Directive. So there is a list of all the sources of renewable energy which are qualified as such in the legislation. So any project which deploys one of those sources of renewable energy as a main component is eligible to apply for the CBRS status. A project might go beyond simple renewable energy generation. It can include additional components. Those components should be integral part of the project, should enable the integration of the renewables, and should be ancillary to the component with renewable generation. What these criteria exactly mean, it will be explained in the next session by my colleague uh, Gianluca Ferreri. On the next slide, I would like to make a summary of the three main criteria for eligibility. So we understood that the project needs to be based on renewable generation as defined in Article 2 of the Renewable Energy Directive. And in addition to this, the project has to meet three basic criteria. The first one is that the project should be built on the basis of a cooperation agreement or any other kind of arrangement between at least two countries or uh, at least two countries or a member state and a third country. In addition, the project must provide cost savings or benefits in comparison to a similar project. And the third element is that the potential overall benefits should outweigh the costs. Now, these two last criteria, number two and number three, can be summarized into one single requirement, which is that the project needs to have socioeconomic net benefits. Effectively, this means that in the broader picture, the project must have an advantage. It must, be, it must be more beneficial in comparison to another project which is without cooperation, so nationally developed project. I'm going to move to the next slide where uh, I would like to stop on the first element from the previous slide, which is the cooperation mechanism. The Renewable Energy Directive defines four types of cooperation mechanisms, all of them individually or in a combination are the basis of the cooperation that we're looking at. So we want the CBRS projects to be based on a joint project between two countries, on a statistical transfer or a combination between joint project and statistical transfer, on a joint project between member states and a third country as defined in Article 11 of the Renewable Energy Directive, and the last option is for the project to be based on a joint support scheme. 
The most evident example that we can see is a, either a classical joint project where simply two countries invest together in developing a renewable energy project and share the costs and the benefits. This can be complicated a bit with statistical transfer. So instead of only sharing the costs and the benefits, member states agree on how to share the statistics coming out of this project. In case of third countries involved, we have one uh, specific additional element of requirement, which is that a physical link is needed between the third country and the EU country in order to ensure that the renewable electricity which is produced and supported by the project actually flows or has the possibility to flow into the EU. So we are looking into any of these four options or a combination thereof. The next slide, I'm going to show how do we evaluate if this element is met by the project promoter. What we look at is a written declaration by the participating member state. This written declaration is not about the name of the document or the form of the document, so we're not looking at a specific format. We're looking at the content of this document, and this document should show that the specific country is willing to support the project and to conclude later on a cooperation agreement uh, in order to implement the project. This declaration has to be signed at government level, so depending on the national rules, it could be a minister, it could be a prime minister, it could be another uh, dedicated uh, person with public functions. However, this has to show the support of the executive power on the specific project. So we are not looking for the fully fledged cooperation agreement. It could be only a document showing the support. But first, the support should be at the level of the member state, government level. And second, the support should be given to the specific project. So not in principle about cooperation between uh, countries, but the cooperation on this concrete project that applies for SEF funding. Next slide, uh, please. I'm going to um, highlight two elements. First, again, we are talking about cross-border projects, but cross-border could be in a border between two countries or border between countries which don't have uh, any physical link between uh, themselves and um, nevertheless cooperate on the project. The cooperation agreement, another point of highlight, since we require support at governmental level, we encourage project promoters to dedicate sufficient time in obtaining this letter because even if it looks rather simple, sometimes it might uh, take longer time. We uh, are happy to provide, and it's actually uploaded on the webpage of CINEA, a very simple template of how such a support letter could look like. So it's really one page where uh, a person on behalf of the government is saying that the government and the member state is standing behind uh, the specific project. Now, on the next slide, I would like to focus on the other two elements for eligibility of the project, which we summarize into one uh, element that is called socioeconomic net benefits. Now, how do we evaluate this element? So the previous element for cooperation mechanism was evaluated by a simple letter. In this case, we are looking at analysis by the project. So this analysis takes the form of CBA, cost-benefit analysis, as we call it. There are seven elements of this cost-benefit analysis. These elements are put in the legislation, so we cannot deviate from them. They're mentioned in the SEF regulation. And we as Commission have adopted a methodology which explains how a project promoter in a very practical manner can implement those seven elements into a cost-benefit analysis. The core of the cost-benefit analysis is to show what are the net benefits of the project and to compare those net benefits to the, be to the net benefits of a counterfactual project. So a similar project, which again is based on renewable energy generation, but is without the cooperation agreement. On the next slide, I'm going to, um, uh, to, to put it a bit in detail. So the objective is to see whether the projects which apply for CBRES status and which are based on cooperation create an added value from an overall holistic and societal perspective. So overall, is the system better off with this project, which is based on cooperation, or the project doesn't bring any benefits and it's better to pursue the project simply uh, on the basis of national efforts, so government-driven, uh, member-state-driven project. Again. The methodology and the analysis is based on seven indicators. Some of them are monetized, which means the indicator is translated into a value 
of euros. Some of the benefits are not monetized, which means that we are going to uh, make uh, qualitative analysis and under those indicators, the project promoter can provide some narrative and to convince us uh, what does the um, benefit consist of. The end result, as I said, is a number. So the overall assessment and this analysis should come up to one specific number, which should be either positive or negative. And this number shows how much euro overall are the benefits or the costs of the project. On the next slide, um, you can click a couple of times to show all the elements. So, the idea of the cost-benefit analysis and the methodological approach is that first we take the case of the cross-border of the cross-border project that applies for status. So the cross-border project, for each of the seven indicators, we evaluate. I mean, the project promoter has to evaluate the benefits, has to evaluate the costs, and has to derive a net present value of the project itself. The same exercise is repeated for a counterfactual. I'm going to explain what the counterfactual means. So again, for the counterfactual, along each of the seven indicators, the project promoters should monetize the benefits, should monetize the costs, and should derive a net present value. And as a last step, the two net present values of the cross-border project that applies and the counterfactual are compared, and we derive the delta, which is the difference and which is the end result that we're looking at. Is it positive or is it negative? If it's positive, then the project has socioeconomic net benefits, which are more compared to a counterfactual. If it's negative, then uh, the cross-border cooperation doesn't have any added value, and it's better that the project is developed uh, on a national level only. In the next slide, I'm going to explain a bit what is this counterfactual. So we compare the cross-border renewable energy project to a similar project or renewable energy project implementing by only one country. So the project that applies is supported by at least two countries, and the project to which we compare is developed by only one country. So we have two options for counterfactual. The first one is for standardized. In this case, we compare apples with apples. So we take an offshore wind park located on the cross-border region between two countries, and we compare it to the same project setup. So again, offshore wind park with similar capacity, with similar project setup, but which is located on the territory of only one country and where a second country is not cooperating. Then we perform these uh, seven indicators calculation for each of uh, the projects, and we compare the net benefits. The second case is a case-specific counterfactual. It's important that the standardized counterfactual is the rule, and the case-specific counterfactual is the exception. This exception applies only if a comparison between, between apples and apples doesn't make sense. This can be for various reasons. First, if we compare a cross-border project which is a uh, project which is uh, offshore wind park, and one of the contributing countries doesn't have access to offshore and uh, to sea in the first place, clearly we cannot uh, compare offshore wind project to a landlocked in a landlocked country. Second reason to choose a counter, counter, uh, case-specific counterfactual is if there is no data availability. In this case, we compare the project with a different project setup, but this setup has to be made as close as possible uh, to the first case. So the, out, the overall energy out, output should be the same. The technologies which are used should be relevant for the counterfactual so, uh, so that they um, realistically present what would have happened in the participating country alone if there wasn't the cross-border cooperation. The scenario which is used for these counterfactuals is the EU reference scenario, uh, which is from uh, 2021. This is the latest solid um, scenario that uh, we suggest for, you, for the project promoters to use. And uh, this scenario shows the project promoter to derive the projections for 15 years ahead, which is the timeline of uh, the cost-benefit analysis. On the next slide, I'm going to very briefly go through all the elements. The first element of the cost-benefit analysis is the cost of energy generation. Basically, this element shows how much does it cost to the specific project to produce renewable energy. This element is analyzed on the basis of a formula. We have provided it in the, in the methodology, and this formula is assessing the levelized cost of energy. So this is a very standard uh, calculation that each project promoter does, in any case, simply to evaluate how much are the expected uh, costs of the project. 
And this formula is also consistent with the way we assess uh, the same value under the innovation fund. So we, we want to show consistency in this approach. The second element is system integration. So the first, ele first element shows how much does it cost to the project promoter to produce the renewable energy. The second element shows how much does it cost to the overall system to integrate the renewable energy which is generated by the project. We have divided this element into three specific types of costs that occur to the system because of the variable nature of the renewables. So first, those are the profile costs. Second, those are the balancing costs. And the third element is the grid-related costs. So in the methodology, we explain and we give examples which are the sources from which the project promoter can derive those values. So those are projections uh, by the transmission system operators or historical data. So there is enough, usually, data availability to estimate how much would it cost to the system to integrate the expected output from the specific project. On the next slide, I am uh, stopping a bit on the third element, which is the cost of support. So here the question is, how much does it cost to the public resources to make the project happen? So which is, how much is the transfer from uh, state resources to the project in order for it, to, uh, for it to materialize. Important caveat, this specific element we want to see as a number. So here um, we're looking not only at the direct renewable generation support schemes which are applicable in the country and which would be relevant for the project, but also indirect support schemes like uh, tax exemptions, uh, investment aid, any other non-repayable type of support. So we want to see how much does it cost to the overall budget for this project to take place. This element is not included in the overall net present value uh, for methodological reasons, because this is not um, effect of the project per se, but simply a transfer of resources. So this number we want to see, but the project promoter doesn't include it in the overall calculation. Fourth element, greenhouse gas emissions. Here, this element addresses the question, how much are the benefits that the project brings in terms of reduced greenhouse gas emissions in the overall system. So first, in order to estimate this, the project promoter is using an established greenhouse gas effects because we're not speaking about only CO2, but there are other greenhouse gases, but there are um, ways to use factors which are equivalent only in CO2 effects. So those are the global warming uh, potentials which uh, the project promoter can use. Secondly, we establish how much greenhouse gas emissions in terms of CO2 are avoided thanks to the project as a result of the generation of renewables, which is a uh, low emission type of uh, generation. And then the last step is to monetize the amount of avoided emissions by the cost of the carbon estimates. We have given you uh, an examples from where to take uh, the projections for how much the carbon prices of ton of CO2 emissions could look like, um, and all the other sources of information are listed in, uh, in our methodology. Fifth element is security of supply. This is a rather general element, which we try to narrow down to a very specific aspect, which is how much is the change of the energy imports thanks to the project, as a result of the project. So the project takes place in a specific country, it produces energy in this specific country, and we expect to replace the uh, produced electricity with imported uh, energy. So the reduction of imports as a result from the production of domestic renewable energy by the project that applies has to be calculated. So it's a very simple, we look at the project, we estimate how much the project produces, and we calculate and reduce this from the overall imports, assuming that this uh, production of uh, renewable energy will directly replace uh, import. This might not be the case in reality, but for, for the purpose of having the cost-benefit analysis, this is uh, how the Commission expects the project promoter to calculate it. The almost last element is air and other local pollution. Here the question is how much is the impact of the project in terms of reduction of air and uh, local pollution? Here we are stopping and focusing only on three major pollutants, uh, nitrogen oxides, particulate matters, and uh, sulfur dioxide. And we want to see how much the renewables production over the lifetime of the project reduces the 
emissions of those pollutants in the air in the uh, specific country. For this, we suggest and we refer to specific established emission factors in terms of uh, kilogram emissions per kilowatt hour of renewable um, electricity. We compare the uh, reduced pollutants with the scenario where the project uh, where the project doesn't take place or takes place in a different form, and we estimate the results of this reduced pollution by multiplying and giving a monetized value of euros for each ton reduced uh, pollution. The last element is innovation. This element is not monetized, so here the project promoter doesn't have to come up with a number in the end, but has to develop a narrative which shows to us, to the Commission, how does the project deploy technological innovation. This could be on the basis of a specific technological solution which is used by the project, or the project promoter can also explain the policy innovation. So we divide uh, the innovation in two aspects, technological and policy. When we come to policy, the innovation could take the form of simply exchange of good practices. It can take uh, the form of uh, harmonization of regulation, of exchange of uh, experience or overcoming existing barriers. So here, again, we look only at qualitative description. These were all the uh, seven elements, uh, and this is also the end of uh, my presentation. Again, one of those points about the eligibility will be developed in the next presentation. But uh, for now, this is how the um, cost-benefit analysis should look like. And now I pass the floor to Gianluca Ferreri. Thank you, Vasil. Yeah, uh, I think there is uh, so far maybe one question from Slido specifically on your presentation part. Maybe Teresa, can you? Yes. So we have one question that uh, can be answered um, already now. Um, it's um, um, is a um, rest generation project uh, between one member state A and um, sale of uh, power to a member state B eligible if no physical power will flow? For example, only virtual sales t t um, towards member state B. The quick reply is yes, as long as the project is based on a cooperation mechanism where country A and country B jointly develop this project. So the way country A and B are involved in the project can take many forms. It can be simply financial transaction. It could be financial transaction plus some, type, some other type of investment. But the two countries should build the project together. So they need to be involved and they need to have a cooperation agreement specifying how do they build the project together? How do they cooperate on this project? Now, whatever happens with the output of uh, the project, whether the electricity remains in the country, whether it's transmitted to the uh, other country, or there is no physical power, in, as in your case, this doesn't matter. It matters that the countries have cooperation between themselves. This cooperation explains how they share the costs and the benefits. and. There could be no physical link between the countries whatsoever, and this will still make the project eligible. So not the physical link is important, but the cooperation between the countries and their joint efforts, which are specified in the cooperation mechanism. Then it could be only um, virtual sales, it could be only statistical transfers, it could be anything, but this has to be part of an overarching cooperation agreement. Thank you, Vasil. I think there are no more questions for the moment on this uh, CBA part and cooperation. So thank you very much. And I'll uh, guide you through the next part of, uh, of the presentation uh, before we go formally in the Q&A part. So we have more and more questions on other parts uh, at the moment. Uh, please don't hesitate to, to keep on uh, uh, posting your question in Slido. So let's uh, have a look now at the evaluation process and the selection criteria. As you can see in the, in the slide, there are basically three main steps. The preliminary check, uh, the evaluation phase, and then the adoption of uh, the CBRS list. First of all, uh, in CINEA and Commission, we run through uh, the preliminary checks uh, aimed at verifying the completeness of uh, the evaluation and whether the key requirements are 
met. I'll come to that uh, specifically in a moment. Then there is the proper evaluation where you can imagine it's really about uh, analyzing the quality of the proposal and uh, checking whether all elements are clearly explained and, uh, and uh, this type of uh, analysis. So I'll, I'll go back to that in a moment. And then there is the uh, discussion in the, uh, in the group, uh, in the CBRS uh, uh, group, expert group, which will receive the draft uh, list and will endorse and adopt the final list before this is uh, formally adopted by, by the Commission. We can look at the next slide on the preliminary check to see what, what it is about. So, first of all, you will have to submit your application via the platform, uh, the submission platform that you can find in the, in the call page. And uh, there um, is very simple, it should be done within the deadline of the 3rd of May. Um, then the application should be complete. And there uh, you will see there are a number of documents which are mandatory and others which are, uh, so to say, optional. Uh, the mandatory document are the CBA Excel tool. You'll find it for download in the call page. It is basically a tool that automatically calculates uh, your project net present value and the contrafaction net present value uh, in function of the value that you have inserted there. Uh, this one is obviously mandatory, it's a key, key element, as uh, Vasil was explaining, all, all, with all the seven elements of the CBA specific for the program. Then there's another document, the uh, application form Annex and CBA report. It is this document where you can provide uh, really the narrative with the explanation of your choices and your calculation, for example, on the CBA and uh, all the details uh, regarding the technical aspect of your project. So this is another uh, mandatory document to be uploaded in the platform. The written declaration uh, of the participating country, Vasil already uh, explained, you can use either the template that you can uh, download in the, in the call page, or if you have it already, uh, a, a declaration or memorandum of understanding on any, any type of uh, uh, document uh, containing the content that uh, Vasil uh, just explained, this is a document that you have uh, to upload. It's really important because otherwise it's not complete. And uh, lastly, uh, but not least, uh, an important document on sustainability and uh, the, a, the NHS uh, requirement. So the, the NHS stands for Do Not Significant Harm um, compliance file. So it's to see whether your project uh, complies with the uh, uh, key environmental uh, uh, rules of the European Union. So the completeness, uh, it's really the important part. Of course, it has to be readable, accessible, printable, drafted in one of the official language, and uh, again, use the mandatory template whenever there is a mandatory template, otherwise upload any other documents that you may consider useful for your uh, dossier. We will, we will then verify the eligibility condition are met uh, in terms of applicant, and there it's fairly straightforward. Basically, the main requirement is that you should be, the applicant should be, or the promoter should be, the legal entity. So it, it should have a, a, a legal, uh, should be a legal entity, either public or private. This is both are both are eligible. And, um, and established in one of the eligible country, meaning depending on the type of cooperation, should be EU member state or uh, third country store, non-EU member state. In that case, you need uh, to ensure physical link uh, to a new member state in terms of your project. So the cooperation, cooperation mechanism, Vasil uh, explained uh, quite extensively there, but it's really an important uh, aspect. Uh, so the form, again, is not so important, but it has to identify the cooperation mechanism that you want to apply. So refer to one of the four me cooperation mechanisms that are in the Renewable Energy Directive, and is signed by a uh, ministerial level, so to say, but at least by a civil servant that is uh, entitled to uh, commit the, the country in question. So it should be signed by, uh, by the, the, the countries participating in the, in the cooperation mechanism, in the future uh, mechanism, 
uh, meaning member state or third country, including third, uh, transit countries where, where it is uh, relevant. So feel free to use the recommended template, but if you have uh, something else, of course, we don't ask you to use it uh, and to replace uh, what, you, what is already uh, ongoing and cooking in, in your uh, various capitals. So uh, what is really important is that the, the document shows the willingness, at least the willingness to conclude a cooperation agreement. Uh, it doesn't have to be already an agreement like a memorandum of understanding uh, uh, identifying all the elements that are listed in the staff working document, but at least, at least it should uh, show the willingness to conclude, to enter into a cooperation agreement uh, uh, should the project be uh, approved. And then there are a series of elements uh, that we would like to see in this document, uh, the, so to say, the more the merrier. Uh, um, so objective of the cooperation, uh, capacity of the envisaged project, the eligible technology, uh, a, an overview or high level statement on the cost burden, cost uh, uh, sharing and benefit sharing. So all these aspects, everything that is possible to, uh, to, um, to conclude or to detail at the stage of the application, it shows a, a stronger maturity of the cooperation, um, but, but at the very minimum, you should uh, have this willingness to conclude the cooperation agreement in one of the uh, of the four mechanisms. Now, the compliance with the selection criteria that are uh, defined in the Delegated Act uh, of, uh, of the CBRS, uh, so uh, that you find in the legal uh, reference also in this presentation and also for download in the call web page. It's very simple in a way. Your project should have uh, the energy generation from renewable energy sources at the core of its, uh, of its structure, uh, philosophy, uh, and uh, there can be additional uh, components that are non-rest generation, so really about uh, 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 other aspects uh, like storage facility system components, uh, integration, information, communication technology, distribution, uh, uh, and, and elements connecting the renewable energy uh, generation to the grid. All this can be part of the project, but it's crucial that these are uh, fulfilling the three, the three points you see in the slide. So integral part of the project enable the integration of the renewable energy uh, component, generation component, and are ancillary to the renewable energy generation component. So really stressing these three aspects and notably the ancillary part. Um, the core uh, business of the CBRS is to deliver more renewable energy generation. And of course, uh, we can look at these uh, additional elements that there are foreseen in the delegated act. Uh, but provided that there are integral part enabled integration and are ancillary, so they are not the main part of your project. So, for example, we have uh, drafted a couple of uh, of possible projects. So these are not real uh, cases, uh, but could be in the future. Uh, in the scenario one, you see the proposal concerned only renewable energy generation. Um, one of the renewable energy technology listed, one or more, listed in the Article 2 of the Renewable Energy Directive. It could be geothermal, hydropower, concentrated solar uh, power, offshore, onshore, wind. Uh, so these aspects are all listed in the directive. The project focuses only on that. It's clearly a, a project that is potentially uh, uh, fitting the CBRS uh, project, provided that it lies in, in a cooperation agreement. The second scenario you see, it's similar, where you have also some uh, additional component, uh, non-REST generation component. Uh, in this case, it's called transmission and storage. Um, typically, you have offshore wind project where often you have this element of connection to the grid that is uh, uh, obviously uh, technically uh, absolutely needed uh, and uh, uh, provided that this part doesn't eat up, so to say, in the, uh, the, the, the renewable energy cooperation co uh, generation component, uh, it is, um, it is uh, potentially a good uh, CBRS project. 
then see a couple of uh, uh, cases where we uh, it wouldn't be uh, fitting into this uh, status uh, um, project, for example, purely or mainly focusing on the transmission or the storage uh, aspect, uh, where the rest generation is not uh, present or is indirectly present and not so clearly embedded in the project. Uh, again, this would be the, the logic reversed of the whole uh, mechanism. And the fourth uh, scenario, you see similar cases where uh, the project uh, is not about renewable energy at all, and, uh, and, uh, and then this is clearly not, not fitting to the, for, to, the, to the mechanism. So again, have a look at the, at the Renewable Energy Directive Article 2, where you have the full list of the renewable energy technology, and all these are potentially eligible for our, our approach, our program. So on the evaluation now itself, uh, the evaluator, so the, the, the evaluation will be, uh, will be done via also the external experts uh, that will evaluate, first of all, the technical soundness of the project. Um, so in a way is to make sure that all the detailed, uh, detailed uh, aspects that are included in the, in the delegated act, and notably in the staff working document, which goes more into the granularity. Notably, you will see section two, three, and four of, of, of the staff working document um, are there, are, uh, are contained in the proposal. The data are reliable, the data are verifiable. I insist on the verifiable aspect. I'll come to that in a moment. Then expert will, will look at the soundness of the CBA. So both the project CBA and the counterfactual, both are equally important, of course, to, to determine if, you, if your proposal should uh, be part of the CBRS uh, status uh, uh, list. We are looking at the uh, to, 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 we, are, we are looking to uh, to see a positive NPV net present value and higher than the counterfactual with the caveat that in some specific cases it could be that the NPV is not positive or even negative and or not higher uh, of the counterfactual. Now there are a couple of elements of the staff working documents that was still uh, explained that are not quantifiable and and do not enter in this calculation of the NPV notably the, the cost of support and the innovation element. In rare cases, but it uh, could happen that the qualitative aspect uh, uh, explain and takes, take, take over, so to say, uh, and compensate the negative MPV. But that's really the, the, the exceptional scenario. So the, the typical scenario is that the MPV of the project is, is positive and it has a higher MPV than the counterfactual. So it goes without saying that um, what is so important is not only adjust the, MPC, uh, the MPV figures in the, in, the, in, in the CBA analysis that you will uh, uh, send, but is how did you reach to the, did you reach this value? So uh, I go back to this verifiable. It's, it's really important that what you include in the CBA tool is transparent. Uh, we can clearly see uh, the calculation behind. Don't paste images, uh, for example. Uh, use the Excel uh, with the formula, because if you paste figures and pictures, well, uh, we can verify your calculation. This is a negative factor in the evaluation. Um, uh, tell us what are the uh, intermediate steps. Uh, so your intermediate calculation, you have uh, you have a, a, a specific sheet in the CBA, CBA tool, where, which is free. It's called Calculation CBA Input. There you can include all your intermediate calculation. That's really important because the expert can verify. And if your assumptions that are transparent and put either in the figures in the CBA and or in the narrative of the uh, Annex uh, tool um, are uh, reasonable, and, uh, and, and uh, transparent, this will be an important uh, aspect and factor to have a positive, uh, positive uh, uh, evaluation. So uh, really I insist on this because in a way was in the first round we have seen one of the big issues where 
the cases where we couldn't verify the calculation and it was not transparent and we couldn't see, uh, the expert couldn't see uh, uh, how, how your proposal uh, came to that final figure. So um, explain your sources, explain your starting point and uh, be transparent in the assumptions. If all this is uh, done uh, correctly, well, uh, then you should, uh, well, you, you, are, you are well, you start well towards a good, uh, a good and positive uh, um, evaluation. Uh, um, then uh, how to fill in this, this important uh, tool, the CBA tool, is very simple actually. You see several tabs. Uh, so this this uh, um, free free tab where where you can when you can uh, insert your old intermediate calculation then there is there is uh, the the tab in uh, called in general and in data where you simply put your figures for each of the main element and then the tool calculates automatically by applying also the various uh, uh, parameters like uh, the the discount rate and other parameters so, so you don't have to do anything in the tool. You have simply to include your final figures there. But it's really important that um, you indicate all the steps, intermediate steps, uh, via via the the, the 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 tab in the tool and also via the annex uh, tool. And lastly, there there are a couple there there are quite a few questions already in the in the in the FAQ published in the call text. Um, I invite you to have a look there because also quite a few. Technical aspect are already tackled there uh, from the previous call, so it can be very useful for to to gather this experience from the from the first round of uh, applications uh, already in this in this one. I think I'm done for my part of the presentation. Then uh, we can move to the Q and A session if there are already questions before the break. Uh, then we can, uh, yeah, Teresa. Exactly. So we already. We already have a few questions that we are going to um, tweet before the break. Um, the first questions will be on the elements for the cost-benefit an analysis and be answered by Vasil. So the first question here is on element um, three, cost of support. Criterion three is not clear how it works. Must it be low or high? The cooperation agreement can take very long time. Do you consider extension of the call? Yes, I would be uh, taking this question. So there are actually two questions in it. The first one is about criterion three of the cost benefit analysis, which is about costs of support. Um, it doesn't matter if it's low or high. It can be both low, low or high. I'm, I'm saying that it doesn't matter in the sense that this value of the cost of support is not included in the overall net present value. So this element is rather for the commission to have a general understanding of what are the support costs related to the specific project in comparison to a national project. So first uh, disclaimer, this number of criterion three doesn't have any impact on the overall net present value, which is uh, the final number that we're looking at. However, it's rather simple to, to estimate the cost of support. First, you as project promoter have to, uh, has to, have to calculate the annual cost of support by looking the expected annual output of the project, how much electricity does it produce, multiply it with the average support in the existing country, which is uh, support per megawatt hour, add to it the SEF support that the project might be uh, willing to obtain and have a reasonable, a reasonable picture of how much money would go from the state to the project as a support measure. Then you do the same with the counterfactual where you take uh, the support schemes of the specific country where the counterfactual is located and you compare the two. So if the project, the cross-border project is requiring or is expecting higher amount of support from the government, public support in all types of support, not only, uh, as I said, feeding premium or contracts for difference, it could be also tax incentives, whatever is in applicable in the country. This amount of public support can be either 
higher than the counterfactual or lower to the counterfactual. This doesn't have any impact on the final result, but we as Commission and the member states which will be evaluating and looking at the project simply want to have this picture as, uh, as a reference for us to understand the public support which would go eventually into the project. Uh, this is the first element of the question. Second element, the cooperation agreement can take a very long time. This is particularly true. You're absolutely right. However, we are not expecting from the project promoter to send us a signed final cooperation agreement. What we're looking at is a letter of support. So from the letter of support, which shows the intention of the country to go into cooperation agreement to the final draft cooperation agreement signed by the ministries of the respective countries is a long, long way. So what we ask you to be ready at the moment of the application is only the first step, which is the letter of intention. Indeed, the cooperation agreement can take a very long time. That's true, but we don't have to extend the call for that because we are not asking for it in the first place. This was the first question. I think the second also, which was relevant. Yes. Um, yeah, I can, um, I can um, uh, read it out again. Um, so yeah, indeed, we have uh, another question um, on the elements uh, for the cost-benefit analysis um, concerning greenhouse gas emissions and, uh, and, and other pollutions. So the question is, uh, criteria for um, gas and CO2, any else? And uh, criteria six, reduction of air pollution, can it happen also in a, a partner country? Under criterion four, greenhouse gas emissions, we evaluate not only the CO2, but all greenhouse gases. However, the project promoters can use the same global warming potential factors which capture all greenhouse gas emissions. So those global warming potential factors are used also by the Commission in its um, legislative uh, initiatives and in, overall in its uh, work. Those values can be derived from the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. So these are the numbers that we as Commission are looking and these are the numbers that you should take. So not only CO2, but all greenhouse gas emissions captured by the global warming potentials of uh, the IPCC. On criterion six on air pollution, the air pollution that is estimated should be the two cases. So the first case is that the project promoter estimates the air pollution in the country where the project is located. So the physical project that applies for cross-border project status. Whatever the country is, that's the country that we're looking at. If it's the two countries, then the air pollution captures two countries. And the second estimation of the air pollution is in the counterfactual. And the counterfactual is only one country, always, which is the national country that would have developed the project if there wasn't the cooperation between the countries. So you have to make two estimations, one in the country where the project applying for status is located, and secondly, the project, uh, the air pollution of the country, which is the counterfactual uh, for the project. So uh, the country partner could be uh, the basis for the estimation of the air pollution, as long as this is the country partner where the project is located, or if it's the country partner where the counterfactual project is located. So it can be the country partner in both uh, these cases. Are there any other questions? Yes, please. Yes, we have another question here. Um, how um, if, uh, if a third country not bordering uh, with an EU partner participates financially to an investment in a member state country um, connected um, to the EU grid, would that be possible? Yes, so usually the, um, uh, the way the cooperation mechanism works is that the EU country is, is, is investing in a third country and then the third country um, exports electricity back to the EU. So I understand that in your case, the third country is participating financially in the investment in the member state country, so it's vice versa, and there is no connection to the EU grid. So this is not, a, this is not the case which is captured by the 
um, by the provision which is in the Renewable Energy Directive. Now on this, uh, the regulation of CEF and the delegated regulation doesn't uh, give a concrete answer, so we might have to uh, discuss internally how would it look like and whether the fulfillment for a cooperation agreement would be met in case the investment goes from the third country to the EU and there is no uh, EU grid. So there is no clear answer to that. What I suggest is to include it in the frequently asked questions and update it uh, on the web page. So at this stage, I prefer not to give uh, a direct answer, but we will come back to this point uh, by Q&A. Um, we will now um, continue um, with the next questions. Um, how many projects did apply in the call for status in uh, 2020, as only three projects were selected for the list of eligible projects? Okay, I, I, I take maybe this question, uh, the reply. So um, uh, in the first call, we had uh, 10 applications, and uh, at the end, we only three where uh, we made it, uh, let's say, to, to the list, both for eligibility requirements and also for uh, project assessment and CBA assessment and cooperation agreement assessment. Next. Is it possible to apply for this call if the application for the preparatory study call has not yet been evaluated? Yes, the reply to this question. The reply to this question is yes, it's possible to apply. There is no, let's say, mandatory requirement to apply for preparatory study in order to apply for a CBRS status call. So uh, any, any project can apply directly to the CBRS uh, status call. Next question. Can a pan-European hydrogen valley proposal apply for the CBRES status, or should it be at a project implementation stage? Uh, okay, so um, to this question, uh, if the, let's say, a hydrogen valley proposal can apply, a uh, pan-European hydrogen valley proposal can apply for CBRES status, uh, we have elaborated today on what are the conditions for eligibility uh, and what are the requirements to apply. So as long as uh, this uh, pan-European hydrogen valley meets the, the conditions of CBRE status, it can, of course, apply. Uh, replying to the question if it should be at a project implementation stage, uh, when the, the projects that uh, we are considering here under CBRS status is a project which is basically under development and implementation. So uh, it is not a project which is already in operation, but it's a project which is being developed. Uh, let's not forget that uh, CBRS status, uh, being a CBRS status uh, uh, project, will give the condition, let's say, the pre-eligibility condition for the CEF calls, which are for works and studies. So they refer to uh, project and uh, activities uh, of a project which is, let's say, uh, bef which is at, at a stage that is not been completed yet. So which is a study phase or construction phase. So this or can be also feasibility phase or pre-feasibility phase. So this is what we look uh, for uh, when a project uh, applies for CBRS status. Uh, another um, question on eligibility. Is it correct that for CB projects with third countries, for example, Ukraine, only projects for renewable electricity production are potentially eligible? For example, no biogas, uh, et cetera. Okay, so uh, I also would like to refer to this to what uh, Vasil uh, said before. So, um, strictly speaking, uh, so in case of projects between member states and non-EU countries, uh, projects that relate to an electricity sector, so here renewable electricity production is correct, and where there is a physical link established with the third country, so between member states and Ukraine, um, and that 
interconnector capacity already exists and will be booked to ensure an infeed of electricity uh, into the electricity system. So this, by default, there is a straight provision in the red directive. And uh, so these projects it, configured in such way they are eligible under CBRS. Um, Vasil was considering a broader, a possible broader interpretation of the rule with non-EU countries, but we have to come back to that in, uh, under, under the FAQs. But in principle, projects between EU and third country with electricity production having already an, a link, a physical link, um, they, are, they are eligible. Let's continue with um, the next question. Um, is this type of project really open to private entities as applicants? From the approved ones, it seems that it's more public oriented. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, it, 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 is, uh, it is really <laughs> open to private, so both are private and pu uh, public. The approved one you have seen, and I invite you to have a look at the transparency platform where you see the details. Uh, there are both types. Uh, true, there is a slight majority of more public uh, type of project, but uh, notably Cicerone, for example, it's, it's a typical example of a more private uh, consortium. So, uh, yes, it is open there. Also, because in, this, in the CBRS project, we are looking really to see the project rest generation. And typically, the rest generation is very often uh, in the hand of the private sector rather than the public. So, absolutely. So, it's it's not just a formally open; it's 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 fully open to both sectors. We continue with um, one last question um, for the moment um, on the available budget. There's a large disparity between the budget of CBRES and PCI projects. Is there an increase in the budget for projects with the CBRES seal foreseen this year? Um, yeah, I can try to reply to this question. So this, let's say, allocation of 15% of the entire CEF energy budget to, to CBRES project is, uh, comes from the CEF regulation. These rules might be subject to, um, let's say, change, this, uh, let's say, allocation might be subject, subject to change, uh, considering, let's say, the potential market uptake of cross-border RES and of RES. Uh, we cannot uh, set in stone uh, that an increase of the budget uh, is foreseen, but there is a possibility for the rules uh, or for, let's say, this allocation to be, to be revised. Thank you, Beatrice. And uh, if I can add there, it's uh, the best way to eventually uh, push towards the, the, the increase is to show interest in the program. So do come with your proposals. And indeed, the provision is really, uh, the, the regulation says subject to market uptake. So depending on how the market answers, uh, the legislator may, may react. So uh, show your interest and then, uh, and then uh, Eventually, the legislator may, may think about it, uh, but uh, we are not yet there. Um, for the moment, any pending question? No? Okay, I think we had already a, a good uh, Q&A Q &A session there, but uh, you can obviously continue posting your question. Um, I suggest we take a break until uh, 4.15, so we are perfectly on schedule. Uh, 4.15, uh, Paul... Uh, Grando will, uh, uh, will show how the portal works um, and how to, how to submit proposal. If during the break uh, there will be new questions uh, there before starting uh, uh, on the portal, we can, of course, go back to that and, uh, and uh, have a, another quick uh, session on Q&A. And then otherwise, Paul will drive you through uh, the, the wonder of the, of the platform. And then uh, Teresa will explain also the call uh, timetable, so in case you get lost, you got lost uh, on all these details, we'll go back to the fundamentals so you don't miss the deadline. And uh, we have also time at the end for uh, extra Q&A, so don't uh, hesitate to write your question, there will be time. 
so in case in case something is boiling uh, up in the coming uh, minutes go ahead with Lido otherwise grab grab a coffee and then uh, come back with us uh, online in uh, 15 minutes thank you very much
So welcome back. Hope you're all there behind the screens. Uh, before so going uh, to the portal, we are talking uh, any pending question. There is one in the Slido. Exactly. So um, the question is, what are some of the most common reasons that CBOS applications are ineligible, unsuccessful? What elements may take much more time effort than we anticipate? Gianluca, could you please share your experience with us? Okay, so the first, uh, there's nothing statistic there because with 10 projects, uh, it's, it's, it's still a small number. But uh, what we have seen in the, in the first call, uh, so one, uh, what I was, uh, we were stressing, uh, the, uh, the various presentation is, is the cooperation part. Uh, some project didn't manage to have the, um, the letter signed. Uh, and again, uh, to, to be clear, we are not asking for the fully fledged cooperation agreement. We are asking for a confirmation, a letter that confirms that the member state or the participating country, I should say, because there can be third countries, are willing to enter into a cooperation agreement and they identify which one. And that's it at this point in time. Uh, willing to enter into an agreement uh, for the for the CBRS project proposed. So at this point in time, that would be enough. Of course, if you have more, better, but that would be enough. In some cases, project didn't manage to have this. Uh, so this is a typical case of uh, ineligible project. And in uh, to to a certain extent, a typical case where a project didn't anticipate the time uh, or the effort uh, uh, sufficiently. Uh, the other aspect is um, well on CBA. The CBA elements they are fairly technical. It depends, of course, also on the type of a promoter or an applicant. Um, if you are more on the public sector side, uh, you may be more experience in getting uh, such an agreement. If you're more into in, in, in the technical uh, operational development, then you may have already uh, lots of technical data. So the CBA maybe is not necessarily the most complex uh, type uh, of, uh, of effort for you. Depends on your profile. Uh, but these are anyhow two very, very important uh, um, elements uh, to consider. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, Take, take the time to, especially on the cooperation, to reach out to uh, the, 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 the country's concern, uh, because in the end, it's just a letter signed, but it's important because in some member states, it can be extremely long to get it. It depends, of course, in the complexity of the administration, whether responsibilities are shared among several ministries, for example. Um, you know, uh, yeah, there are member states that are more, more, more complex in that. In, in a machine, it takes more time to, to reach the decision-making level. And other, other way, it may take a few weeks and, and, and you are done and you have the support letter. So this is a, a typical. And one last but very important point is um, not really in eligible cases, but projects uh, that were not successful. successful. We had some cases of where the renewable art part was not clearly the center of the proposal. So um, this is really a, not, not, not cosmetic part. So uh, it, it has to be really clearly the core of the proposal. And it, ha it has to be clear also how you, how you get there. Uh, and of course, it's not yet at the status that you get there, but it clearly should be cl credible that there will be new renewable energy production out of the project, so this this was the fir this first aspect was uh, uh, was also a clear weakness in some of the proposal. Okay, uh, I think there were for the moment no more questions. So maybe we go to the demonstration part of the platform. So Paul, the floor. Good morning, everybody. Oh, sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I will be quickly walking you through. Uh, how to do an effective uh, proposal on our new submission platform. But before starting anything, uh, for you to be able to submit an application, you need to have an EU login. Uh, this is for security purposes, and it's basically, uh, it, it will provide you with a two-step verif verification process. And uh, after doing this login, this login account, you'll be able to go on the submission platform. 
So how to access the submission platform? Well, it's very straightforward. So if we go on the call page of uh, this call for status, you go on the how to apply section and you click on dedicated uh, CBRS submission platform. Here you can also find how to create an EU login before uh, logging into the submission platform. You log on the submission platform and a first window will pop up. If the window doesn't pop up, you can also create a new application here by selecting the open core and creating a new application. So you enter your project name, for instance, um, amazing CBS project, the acronym ACP, and you save your application. It will appear here, and then you have two ways for you to uh, edit it. The first way is you click here, edit application, or here on the ID link. So if you click here, there you go. Now you're inside the, your application, and there is eight sections for you to fill in. I will walk you uh, quickly on the eight different sections so we are all clear on uh, what you need to do to submit a very good CBLS application. So the first step, project name, project acronym. So these are already filled in from the initial information that you uh, uh, inputted when you created the application. Then if you click edit here, you can also input the project website. So here, at any time, any, uh, during any section of the application process, if you see sections which are labeled with a red asterisk or which are labeled in red just like this, it means that these sections are compulsory and you will need to, sub, uh, to fill them in uh, to be able to submit your application. So remember every time to click, to click on save and then it will be written here, data saved successfully. So to move on to the second section of your application, you have to input the project promoter's details. So here, it's important to differentiate two things. Um, so if your project has several beneficiaries, you will need to nominate a project coordinator and uh, then list all the, the relevant beneficiaries. But if there's only one project promoter, this project promoter will, by default, be the pro project coordinator. So you click on here, add, the legal name, for instance, uh, European Commission. Of course, you, <laughs> you shouldn't put European Commission. Uh, the legal status, private, public, legal entity. And here, the role I'm mentioning, whether the beneficiary is coordinator or promoter. So again, if there's only one beneficiary, please select coordinator. If there's several, well, you have to Obviously, you know which one will be the coordinator or the promoter. Input the address. So here, I'm not going to do examples. City, postcode, country, Austria, for instance, the relevant web page, and the different contact persons uh, for this beneficiary. So here, you have to put title, for instance, Dr. Jean Dupont, email, etc and etc and then you click save obviously here you need to fill in email and phone and you click save here all right now we come to a very important section of your application the cooperation mechanism this is the basis of uh, your cbs project so here you need to be very very careful i i would like to highlight here so when you click edit that you have to select the desired cooperation mechanism that corresponds to your project. So whether it's a statistical transfer, joint support scheme, joint project scheme, either between member states or with a third country. So here, if we take the example of a joint project between member states, you have to here list uh, the level of maturity of this cooperation uh, uh, agreement. So as we said before, you can uh, solely put a letter of intent at this stage uh, and specify which relevant authority has given you this letter. But it's very important that for every document that you list here, you will have to submit it in the annexes. We have had applications in the past where um, specific documents were listed here, 
but uh, they were not included as annexes, so this undermines the quality of your application. So for instance here, a uh, letter of intent issued by uh, Ministry of Energy of Austria. I'm sorry about this. Austria. Okay, click save. All right. What this will do is that then in the following sections, you will be able to fill in section 4.1, 5, 6, 7, etc. If your cooperation agreement is not a joint project, but a joint support scheme or a joint or a statistical transfer, so if we click save here, you will not be able to input information in section 5 and 6. So here, for instance, you see you're not able to input information. That's why you have to be very careful as to which cooperation agreement you select, because this will determine which information you need to provide us. So here, same, you will just be asked to provide uh, information for question 4.1, and that's it. So to walk you through all the different steps, I will go back to joint pro project between member states. So here you see, you can start filling in all these other questions because the red asterisk is appearing again. So here, project general information, please provide a short description of the cross-border REST project. Here, uh, just a general ex uh, summary of the project would be sufficient uh, explaining which is the REST generation part, if there is ancillary elements such as storage, transmission, etc. cetera, uh, which sector it applies to, electricity, gas, etc. if other you specify. So if you click other here, this box will be unlocked. And again, it appears in red for you to fill in. Again, fill in the technology uh, which your project concerns, etc., and etc. The volume and uh, estimation emission savings, estimated generation, the value of the estimated generation, etc. So now we come to section five, which is the location and implementation schedule of your project. So here, it's very exciting because we have a new feature. Uh, for you to use, and it's basically a GIS um, uh, input on our submission platform, which enables you to map directly on the map uh, the different elements of your project. So you can add them directly here on the platform, but uh, if you also have a GIS platform uh, inside your company, you can also import directly the data. Here, by clicking Upload File, you select uh, the File tab, and click Add File. So just to give you a quick uh, example, for instance, so in the case that you want to create an infrastructure in Brussels, for instance, uh, so wonderful city of Brussels, here, Parc du Cinquantenaire, you have the commission building, and uh, your project wants to, is, uh, for instance, an um, uh, offshore project. So. Here on the add infrastructure, you have different infrastructure types. So point infrastructures, line infrastructure, and polygon infrastructure. So for instance, you want to put a floating offshore wind farm next to the commission. So you click on the facility, you do the polygon here, and remember to click save. If not, it will not appear. And here you go. This is the uh, offshore wind farm. And then if you want to add a transmission line because you want to connect it to the UK, you can add a transmission line by doing electricity line and you connect it to Ipswich, for instance. And remember to double click for it to appear here, click save, and there you go. This is your project. So the different list of infrastructures will appear in the list of inf infrastructures here. So the line, the point, polygon, etc. Um, and this, of course, you can do across the map. It's a really wonderful tool. So after you filled in this section, you go and edit, and there's uh, a number of other questions you will need to fill in. For instance, the feasibility study start date. If it's not yet known, not applicable, you have to put the date, etc., etc. The FED study, environmental impact assessments, all these are uh, requirements. So please do fill in uh, these questions and always press save here. Data saved successfully. 
uh, and normally the project should appear again here. It takes quite a bit of time to upload. If it doesn't happen now, I'll just move on. Okay, let's move on. So then question six, which again, you can only reply to if you have a, uh, a joint project, not if it's statistical transfers or joint support scheme. So here again, please indicate all the, value which are, all the values which are uh, compulsory. Here, in sensitive information, uh, you must indicate to us which information you wouldn't like uh, to be uh, publicized. For instance, when you apply to CBRS status, and if you're granted the CBRS status, we can then uh, have several promotional events in which we will showcase your project. And if there's any information that you want, don't want to be disclosed, please specify it here. Uh, because it will also appear on the transparency platform that we presented to you earlier. And so, for instance, click yes. Here you fill in, fill in, click save, and there we go. Data saved successfully. So here, final, uh, in the final annex section, it's all the annexes which you have to upload for your application to be successful. How do you find the, uh, the documents for you to fill in? You can click on useful links, which is also the box here. So if we click on useful links, there you go. So here you have the first link, which uh, will direct you to the website of uh, the Directorate for Energy and also back to the core page. So if you go down, scroll down, more information, here you have the legal framework, and here you go, mandatory annexes. So the CBA tool, the uh, CBA report, the sustainability compliance file, uh, which you will have to fill in and to resubmit here in the annex. So by su to submit the annex, you press edit, attach file, etc., etc. Okay, click save. Always remember to click save. If not, you will lose the data. Data saved successfully. So, if we go back to the core page, you will have also you also have a number of documents that are here to help you out throughout the submission process. So, if you want to have more information on the GIS tool of question five that we showcasted earlier, you can click here. If you have issues um, using the submission platform, we also did a submission platform user manual which is quite handy, which will walk you through each different sections. Here you can see you click on project promoter details, it guides you to project promoter details, costs, etc., and etc. Okay, so um, a few last things as I want to highlight to you. So here, if you go and check and submit, and the, you will see all the different questions which have not been answered for which you need to fill in for you to submit the application. So here, obviously, you see that there's a, lots of, a lot of questions. Hopefully, you will have no yellow box by the time you need to submit. And then you click Submit, and that's it. Uh, what you need to know is that if you submit your application uh, many weeks before the submission uh, deadline, you can always go back to the submission platform and you can edit it. So even if it's submitted, you can re-edit it and add more information, amend information, no problem. What is also great also, so if I go back in the application of our great project, throughout the process, you can also download the documents. Um, okay, sorry, here it's not showing up. Application management, uh, da, da, da. sorry. Check and submit. Download application. There we go. So if you click download application, here you, you'll be able to download uh, your application in a Word file with all the different questions that you will have filled in. So this is great for archiving purposes if you want to uh, amend it amongst the different beneficiaries, etc. and etc. So, okay, this is taking quite a long time. So probably not now. Ah, there we go. So here you can see amazing word file. It's a really great tool. We're really happy to have this new platform because before we did it on EU survey and now it's really making things easier for both you and us. So uh, going back to our presentation, 
So access the submission platform, there we go. Sorry, so this is just a manual link. Yeah, so last recommendations. Uh, please provide project-specific data and justified cases uh, where project-specific data is not available. So for instance, uh, st the statistical transfers, you will not be um, required to submit it, but please, please be as precise as possible. Uh, data sources must be ver verifiable. So again, if you mention in the in your application that you have a letter uh, of intent with so and so um, institution, please provide it in the annexes because uh, this will uh, contribute to the quality of your application. And finally, the calculation of your CBA must be sound and correct. Uh, we have financial officers, which of course. Uh, and financial engineers which will verify the soundness of your CBA uh, in a very thorough process. A final applicant checklist. So the deadline for this call will be on the 3rd of May 2023 at 5 uh, p.m. Brussels time. Uh, please submit again all the mandatory annexes and proofread your proposal uh, because we often see typos which also again undermine the quality of your applications. If you have any other questions uh, concerning the submission platform, please do not hesitate to post a question on Slido. And now I will pass the floor to my colleague, Teresa, so she can walk you through the different steps of uh, the upcoming timeline. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, indeed, I'm going to um, walk you now um, through the uh, indicative timeline. Um, if we look on, on this um, slide, um, indeed the um, West, um, CB, CB West um, status call um, has opened um, on the 10th of January. And as um, my colleague Paul just um, told you, the call uh, will be closing on the 3rd of May at uh, 5 uh, p.m. So what is happening um, between now and the 3rd of May? For once, uh, we have, uh, uh, we just had the, um, the uh, info day. Um, we were already able to um, answer um, um, lots of your questions. Um, what we are going to do um, is also go through them and see um, if we um, need to um, add one uh, or another question um, to the already existing um, FAQ document, um, which you can find um, on the CORE website um, on the um, CYNEA um, webpage. Um, so it is a very good document um, to look at. Um, there's already a number um, of questions and answers there, I think around um, 70. So a very good um, resource for you um, to see and check um, if your uh, potential questions are um, probably already um, covered. But indeed, we are going to make sure um, to um, add any questions um, to the FAQ document um, if necessary. Um, on this note as well, um, of course, if you um, don't find um, your question covered um, yet, it's of course possible and to um, contact us um, at um, CYNEA, um, and we will see um, if um, those questions um, will be added um, because they are of general interest um, to, the, um, to the FAQ document. Um, please note that um, if you ca contact us, um, we are not in a position um, to um, give you individual um, feedback uh, on a um, potential a draft application or, or project um, in order to ensure um, the equal treatment um, of um, applicants. So, um, ah, yeah, and it was at one point that you've heard from my colleague, um, you can work on your um, application, submit it, and also until 3rd of May, um, yeah, adapt it uh, if necessary. Um, but if it's the 3rd of May, 5 o'clock, um, this is a definite, um, definite deadline. Um, what's going to happen um, afterwards? Um, this is um, what um, we call the evaluation um, period. And um, so after the, um, um, the deadline um, of the call, um, we as commission are going to assess um, the applications 
and external um, experts are going to um, evaluate um, the proposal against the um, criteria um, established in the call um, document. Um, like as a result um, of um, this evaluation period, um, the commission um, with the external um, expert are going to establish, um, um, let's say, a first list uh, of potential CB um, West projects, uh, which is going to be uh, looked at um, and um, finalized by the um, CB West um, member state um, group. And um, um, this group um, then is going to, um, to finalize um, the um, um, CBRS status um, list, um, which is then, um, um, yeah, in a, in a following, um, going to um, lots of uh, formal steps as well, which um, include um, an inter-service uh, consultation um, in the commission. And um, as a result of that, um, there will be the formal um, adoption of the CBRS um, um, status um, list. Um, this is also the moment um, where then um, the letter of um, the results um, are going to be um, um, transferred um, to the applicants. Um, we foresee um, this to be happening um, uh, around uh, mid-August. Um, there are, of course, two possible outcomes. Um, we hope for all of you um, that's going to be a positive um, um, outcome um, of your application, but it can, of, of course, also be a negative one. Um, in that case, um, it's uh, possible to um, um, apply again in the future um, for the CBRES um, status, um, status call. Um, the CBRES status um, call is going to be organized at least once per year. Um, in the positive case, and uh, we are crossing um, fingers for all applicants, um, the letter um, with a positive um, result is going to be sent to, to the applicant um, together um, with an inf uh, invitation um, from us, from Sainia's side, um, for informal um, contacts. Um, those will then include in the following, because that covers the period until um, the CBRES list will um, officially enter into force. Um, it's yet still an informal, um, it's an informal period um, because um, it could still be um, um, that there is object, uh, objections and so on. Um, so as long as the uh, um, CBRES list is not officially um, um, entered into, um, into force, um, everything will still be more like having an informal um, character. Um, but this will already allow us, so this time period from August to, let's say, October, November, um, to, have, um, the first, um, to have the first contacts, for example, inform um, the CBRES status um, list projects about their obligations, but also already inform them about the upcoming um, call for uh, CBRS um, studies and, um, and works. Um, so then we would be um, with the date in October, November and the um, entry into force of the CBRS list. And we can go to the next slide um, where um, we have um, the um, timeline for the time um, after um, selection. So um, once, like uh, as we've um, yeah, informed today, um, the um, CBRES um, um, status um, will give the possibility um, to um, apply um, for works and um, studies. And uh, the first possibility um, for that um, will already be um, foreseen to be in November um, 23. It's, of course, also possible to apply for a later um, call for works and studies. Um, but let's see, this is already the first um, opportunity um, for the projects that um, have just received the um, CBRES um, status. And um, for this um, um, future call um, to be launched, we are going to foresee 
um, the results um, of the call um, for works and studies um, in May um, 24. Um, on, the, on the last um, slide, um, you can um, still um, find um, relevant, relevant links. Um, there's for once a CBRES um, call page, um, which uh, my colleague um, Paul have, uh, has just um, already um, shared with you, as well as the CBRES submission portal. Um, on both pages, but uh, mainly on the CBRES call page, you find all the um, necessary documents, um, also um, helpful um, um, guidance um, for you, and um, the FAQ documents that I have just mentioned um, beforehand. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, so it's good to see also the, the, the longer time perspective. So you see what happens from uh, now in the, in the next 12 months, so to say. And you see the, the bigger picture, of course, these dates, especially regarding the works and study call, uh, is to be taken as uh, indicative. Uh, so it can be May, it can be maybe even earlier, um, the decision uh, there. but. Uh, uh, so you see more or less where we are going and when uh, this is going to happen. So, and it's going to be yeah the first uh, option uh, for those entering into the call, into the into the status um, CBRS status. And uh, because this was one of uh, several of the questions we received uh, often also from the first project in the list, this is um, one uh, well the first uh, window so to say. So you can apply even later and you don't lose the status uh, uh, for that, provided that you show that you continue, you progress on the implementation, you, you can apply uh, in later calls and uh, depending on the stage of maturity of your project for either works or uh, studies uh, uh, or rather the other way around, often first were studies and then uh, eventually works when you are uh, very mature. So, but of course depends on on case, uh, on, on each of the cases. Maybe a couple of points on the on the platform um, is um, just to stress again: submit as soon as possible, in the sense that you, as soon as you have a, a decent amount of information in your application, uh, do submit because uh, indeed this, the, the system allows you to re-enter at any point, even several times in a day, and uh, redraw, add element, and then uh, resubmit. So you don't around the super high stress of the last day, you know that you have secured at least a good application at some point uh, several weeks before, and, uh, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, you, you can fine tune and you will have at least a good application there. The other, the other reason why I invite you really to use the platform as soon as possible, even tomorrow, just by creating, even, uh, if, 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 even if not just the name of your project, is because then we you are in the system and you can be addressed by um, you know general uh, information about, for example, new version of the FAQ available in the call uh, web page. If you are not in the system, we don't know you, so we cannot uh, send any <laughs> any communication other than, uh, of course, the the many many communication uh, tools we use via Cinea. So of course we will publicize each time we uh, we update. FAQ with new questions via via the usual channels, so the, the social media, and, uh, eventually the news, uh, and you regularly check the call page will be there. But okay, this is a plus. If you are in the system, you get even a notification that that something important is waiting for you there. So please use the system as soon as possible, and you get familiar. You will see it's very it's very intuitive. And the other last point about the sensitive information that you should indicate, uh, of course, everything, uh, well, there are some information that would go into the transparency platform, um, and, and you invite you to, to, to look at the type of information that we put uh, in the platform, uh, but this will be done, of course, only on projects that are selected first, and uh, before we do it, uh, we, we double check anyhow with each and every, and, and every project. So don't worry, we are not going to put uh, lots of sensitive information public without uh, having discussed with you uh, in the first time uh, available. Okay, 
Uh, so a few few points. Uh, anything uh, I forgot? No. Um, I think from the question, we don't have any question at this stage. But okay, we have had uh, quite a lot of question uh, along the along the event. So it's possible that we uh, exhausted it at least for for today's event. I'm just waiting a few few seconds more. Um, in uh, in case you have questions that are not addressed during this. Uh, what during today's uh, meeting or you couldn't attend and you are watching this recording in uh, a week's time and you have questions and you cannot see the answers either in the call text or in the in the in the legal text or in the in the extensive faq uh, published in the call we invite you to get in touch with us uh, you see all the contacts there so cinesf renewables is the main uh, uh, web uh, address or uh, email address, uh, rather. Uh, please do send us all your questions there if you have anything that is um, unaddressed or any doubts. Uh, again, uh, as, uh, as Teresa said, we cannot advise specifically on your project, how to make it good or bad, uh, but uh, if you have questions regarding to process, to documents, to rules, to eligibility, um, anything related that can be generalized, we are more than happy to, to reply to you. And if uh, the, your question is not yet in the repository of the FAQ, we will uh, begin on, on, uh, on uh, in increasing the FAQ list and, uh, and uh, so that everybody um, profit of your question. So uh, go ahead with that and stay, stay in touch with the various uh, channels, Twitter, and uh, yes, uh, very important. Uh, don't remember to uh, yeah. Don't forget to to reply to your satisfaction survey. Uh, it's already uh, published on Slido, um, so it takes really few minutes. But these are few very precious minutes uh, uh, for for collectively because we always systematically have a look see what was uh, most appreciated, most uh, interesting or least interested, and that's how we improve the service and that's how we change, uh, fine-tune the, the, the PowerPoint, the presentation and the techniques we use in this, uh, in this type of event. These are done for you to make it uh, useful for you, so really the feedback survey it's not just a tiny administrative uh, thing we do, we really uh, use it and we care for it. So. If you can uh, take a few minutes, and if you can do it right away, it's even better because you have a fresh memory about uh, about the event, you, and you don't forget uh, after a few days, uh, then it's all gone, and you turn the page, and you'll start probably writing uh, your application, looking for the right partners, uh, reaching out the member state. Uh, don't forget in the in the list in the in the CBS website there is a list of contact point. Uh, member state contact point for each of, uh, of the member state, at least on the EU, and the third country we don't have, but at least EU we do have a full list. So if you have um, difficulties in getting the, the agreement, even if you don't have difficulties, you don't know where to start from in the member state, but you could start from that, from the persons that are listed in the, in the contact list. Anything I forget? No, forgot? Nothing? Well, then I look, no questions there. And we, yeah, we just thank you for, for staying online and um, yeah, looking forward. And we can also stay a little bit more in the yeah, online a couple of minutes if you, if you are still thinking about the question there. But uh, yeah, we can stay online and then if there are questions, we can come back uh, on air.